Hey everybody, today I'm out here near San Antonio taking a look at the all-new 2020 Toyota Highlander Hybrid. If you want to know more about the non-hybrid model, then there's a separate video on my channel on that. Be sure and check that one out as well. In this video, we're going to be talking just about the hybrid model. The 2020 Highlander Hybrid is an entirely new vehicle. This shares essentially nothing with the outgoing model, including the hybrid system, which has now been borrowed and upgraded from the Camry and the RAV4. So this is a four-cylinder hybrid, not a V6 hybrid like the last year. As we see in the RAV4 lineup, the hybrid version of the Highlander looks very much like the non-hybrid version. Really, the only difference up front is going to be this blue Toyota logo right there on either side of these wings. Now, the front end look reminds me an awful lot of modern Subaru models. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. This is really a new design for Toyota. It looks somewhat like the last Highlander, but definitely distinctive, a little bit more elegant, also a little bit more upright. That tells us that the hood has been raised up from the last generation to give this a little bit more of a truck-like appearance. All versions of the Highlander Hybrid will get full LED headlamps. We're in the top end trim, so these are the steering LED headlamps. They also auto level, and then we have fog lamps down below. The first hybrid badge you'll find is right here on the side of the Highlander, and a quick reminder that we are driving pre-production vehicles is this all-wheel drive logo down here at the bottom of the door. This particular vehicle is not all-wheel drive. This is actually only front-wheel drive, and I have verified that by crawling under the car and verifying that there is no electric motor in the rear. So unfortunately, this badge is incorrect, but that's the sort of thing that happens when we're trying to take a look at brand new vehicles like this. These were all pre-production cars. They may not have been built exactly the same way as the production models. So some of the fit and finish, some of the badging may be incorrect, and this is definitely one of those items. Moving around to the side, you'll notice this really extreme haunch right back here that's definitely added a bit of style to the side of the Highlander, and it's grown in terms of overall size versus the last generation as well. This is now just under 195 inches long, and they've stretched the wheelbase also versus the last generation model. In terms of overall dimensions, that keeps the Highlander sort of on the low side of the three-row crossover segment. You will definitely find longer three-row crossovers and longer three-row SUVs as well. Toyota tells us that that's exactly how Highlander shoppers like it, because this is going to be a lot easier to park in some of those urban or suburban situations than something like a Chevy Tahoe, which for 2019 does not really have that much more room on the inside, even though on the outside it is significantly larger. And space efficiency has long been a strong selling point for the Highlander. Another strong selling point for the hybrid model is that this is one of the very few three-row hybrid vehicles available in America and the only hybrid vehicle in America that is available with eight seats on the inside. Now, admittedly, the eighth person sitting back there in the middle of the third row is not going to be quite as comfortable as in a vehicle that only had a two-person third row, but this has eight seat belts, and if you need that, this is going to be one of your only options in America and one of the very few hybrids available in the world with an eight-seat configuration. Aside from the Highlander, in America, you have very few three-row hybrid options, period. You could consider this as direct competition to something like the Acura MDX Hybrid, especially in this top-end Platinum trim. The price tag is really not very far off. But this is designed to do very direct business with entries like the Ford Explorer Hybrid, which is all new for 2020 as well, and something like the Chrysler Pacifica Plug-in Hybrid, even though that's a plug-in and this is a standard hybrid that doesn't have a plug. The big difference between this hybrid and the Ford Explorer hybrid is that the Highlander is seriously focused on fuel economy, whereas the Ford Explorer is focused a little bit on fuel economy, but also on retaining performance and towing ability in line with the rest of the Explorer lineup. So it has much higher towing ability than we find in this model. It also has more power at over 300 horsepower, but the fuel economy is significantly lower. We're talking 10 miles per gallon lower all-wheel drive to all-wheel drive. Moving to the rear, there's again very little differentiation between the hybrid and non-hybrid model. We have the blue Toyota logo right there. We have the hybrid badge over there on the other side as well. Now, one big change from the previous generation Highlander is that we no longer have a glass that opens separately from the hatch. Toyota has done this to save weight in the vehicle and make the hatch a little bit lighter, but I have to say I really liked the glass that opened separately. It made it very, very cargo practical because if you don't like items falling out of your cargo area when you open the hatch, you could just open the glass interact with that cargo, close the glass, then open the hatch. Under the hood is where we find perhaps the biggest change for the 2020 Highlander Hybrid, and that is the hybrid system itself. Instead of using a V6 engine like we saw in the last generation model, this now uses essentially the same 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine we see in the RAV4 Hybrid and the Camry Hybrid. But rather than using all of the same components that we find in the RAV4 and Camry, Toyota tells us that we have a new hybrid synergy drive setup over here on this side of the engine bay that uses motors that are more similar to the outgoing Highlander than the RAV4. And that's why this hybrid system produces 243 horsepower total, not just over 200 like we see in the Toyota Camry. 
Also a change for 2020, the Highlander Hybrid is now available with front wheel drive only rather than just the e-all wheel drive system that we saw in the last generation. That's going to give you the best fuel economy because it's the lightest version of the hybrid. 36 miles per gallon in combined driving. That's the one that we're driving right here. If you add the e-all wheel drive system, then that adds extra weight and drops the fuel economy down to a still very healthy 35 miles per gallon. This is significantly more fuel efficient than the last generation Highlander Hybrid and really more fuel efficient than just about any other three row hybrid. Located in the rear of the vehicle is a nickel metal hydride battery pack with a capacity approximately two kilowatt hours. An interesting twist with this generation of Toyota's hybrid synergy drive is that they're not really giving us a lot of detailed information about what's going on under the hood. They haven't given us any details on the motor specifications under the hood. They haven't told us what the rear electric motor is rated at, and they haven't told us what the battery pack is rated at either. They've given us some general guidelines, but we don't know exact numbers. Based on what I've been able to get out of Toyota so far, I suspect the rear electric motor is probably rated between 80 and 90 horsepower, probably 120 to 130 pound-feet of torque. Now, the horsepower total is identical whether you get the e-all wheel drive version or the front wheel drive model that again we're looking at right here. However, it is worth noting that the e-all wheel drive version is going to be a little bit quicker because even though the total horsepower doesn't change, it's still 243, the total torque does appear to change and that's why the e-all wheel drive version is a little bit swifter. And now it's time to answer a few questions that you all had over at alexandautos.com. The first one was, why did Toyota downsize the hybrid system on this from a V6 down to the four-cylinder hybrid system? Well, the big reason was, that's what they tell us customers were asking for. Customers were apparently telling Toyota they really wanted much better fuel economy in the Highlander Hybrid. They didn't just want a modest bump in fuel economy, they wanted an extreme bump in fuel economy. So this takes things up to 36 miles per gallon, definitely very high for a seven-seat or eight-seat hybrid. The other question that came from Facebook was, why is it that Toyota is still using a nickel metal hydride battery pack? Why didn't they upgrade into a lithium ion pack? Well, the real answer for that is that a lithium ion pack is not necessarily an upgrade, depending on exactly what you're doing with the hybrid as far as the programming of the system goes. Nickel metal hydride packs have really great lifetime characteristics. They have good self discharge characteristics and excellent cold weather performance. Nickel metal hydride battery packs generally will work a little bit better in chemistries that are used most often in hybrids like this in cold weather situations than lithium ion packs. And of course, there's the long warranty that we get on this vehicle. Because of the way that they're using batteries in hybrid systems like this, Toyota feels that the nickel metal hydride pack is gonna give them a lower cost and a better lifetime. This battery pack is warranted for 10 years and 150,000 miles. So if you're worried about hybrid system lifetime, know that this is backed by the longest battery warranty in the industry at the moment. Just as you'd expect out of a modern crossover, front seat comfort is excellent. We have a power driver's seat over here with a two-way lumbar support. We also have seat memory over there on the door. Again, remember we are in the platinum trim. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion and a fairly comfortable passenger seat as well. Although it's worth noting, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat, even in this top end trim. And for this amount of money on some of the competition, most notably the near luxury or luxury competitors, you would have four-way adjustable lumbar support. Hopping into the second row, we definitely find more comfortable seats than we found in the last generation Highlander. I think that's the biggest improvement on the inside for me. These seats slide forward and backward. There's a lever there so you can apportion space a little bit more equitably between the three rows in the vehicle. We also have a pretty exaggerated recline. You can see you can really recline these seats pretty far rearward. I'll move it forward so you can see right there. Now on the downside, you should know that these seats are not designed so that way you could leave a child seat latched into place using the latch anchors and then still tilt and slide the seat forward for easier access to the third row. Now, if you get the seven seat version, you could of course go right there through the middle, but these seats do have very comfortable armrests, and that means you're gonna have to be pretty skinny to get back there in the third row. You could also slide this seat all the way forward like that, but it's not gonna be as convenient as some of the alternatives like the Atlas, the CX-9, or the Pathfinder that do tilt and slide the seat forward in a different manner when a child seat is latched into place. If that situation describes you, then you should know that like the Ascent and the Honda Pilot, you only have about this much room right here to squeeze through here to exit the third row. This is especially important if you do get the eight seat version of the Highlander because it's a bench in the middle, then there's no way to escape right there. Toyota tells us that the battery pack is located somewhere under this rear seat area here, but it doesn't really change the third row accommodations too much. Remember that the Highlander is on the small side of the segment as far as three row crossovers go, so even in the gasoline version, you're gonna find more room in something like the Palisade or the Telluride, something that is a little bit bigger. But as I said before, we have very similar room in here to something like a Chevy Tahoe. Now, 
the third row is still pretty compact, so I could squeeze myself behind the second row seat with it slid all the way back, but a more realistic way is to just slide the seat a little bit further forward. And if I were to do that, I would definitely have enough room for me as a six foot tall adult in the front seat and in the second row seat and back here in the third row seat. I'd have about two inches of legroom left in all three rows. If you get the eight passenger version, then we get the seat that I'm sitting in right here. The center seat is definitely higher off the ground than the outboard seat, so it is going to be a little bit less comfortable. You'll really notice that because of this bump right here in the roof. Now, this particular trim does not have the panoramic moonroof, so instead we get this kind of bump right here where the map lights are in the ceiling and where the lid for that sunroof would move back to. It's okay if I'm sitting with my head back there on the headrest or in a position like this, but if I lean forward, then my head bops right there on this light area, and that's because, again, that seat is higher off the ground. So if I do that over here, there is definitely a lot more clearance room going on on either of these other sides. It's also worth noting that the center seat position does not have any latch anchors. So if you're looking for child seat attachment there in the middle of the second row, you're gonna to wanna to use the shoulder belt only. It's also worth noting that unlike some of the options in this segment, we don't have latch anchors here in the seat position. We do have a top tether anchor and we have a shoulder belt that comes out of the seat itself. So you won't have any problems attaching child seats in the middle. You just won't have the latch anchors if that's something that you're looking for. Something else worth noting is that these seats also move in the exact same manner as the captain's chair. So if I pull this lever right here, the seat tilts and then slides forward right like that. Same thing on the 60% side, so you could not leave a child seat latched into place in this version either. Because of the positioning of the hybrid battery pack, cargo capacity remains the same as the non-hybrid model, which is an improvement over the 2019 Highlander. So we get 16 cubic feet of storage space back here, but in reality, if you are planning on putting three rows of people and three rows of people's luggage in the back, you're gonna be better off with a minivan like the Sienna. Still, most people in their three row crossovers tend to leave the third row seats folded most of the time. And if you do that, you're definitely going to get more cargo room back here than you'll find in your average two row crossover. So that's definitely a reason to buy the Highlander still. Under the cargo area load floor, we have a little bit of additional storage space and we have a 1500 watt inverter right over there in the back. That's one of the most powerful inverters you'll find in any vehicle available in America. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the platinum trim, so there are a few things in here that we won't see in the lower end trims. This model has this large panoramic moonroof that goes right there over the rear passenger's heads. We also have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and two-way adjustable headrests. Since we're driving the top end trim, we have perforated, ventilated, and heated front seats. We also have some additional stitching right there, giving it sort of a quilted appearance. If I move on over to the rear seats, you'll notice that we get the same pattern there in the leather, but we don't get the extra stitching. The majority of this interior is the same as the V6 trim. So we have these brown interior parts, which I think really dress up the interior a lot. I am partial to brown interiors. So let me know what you think about that down below. This is a tritone interior. So the B pillars, the A pillars, the roof of the vehicle, those are all charcoal, but the door is this sort of caramel color mixed with the brown. We then have imitation wood trim on the upper section of the door. A lot of stitch touch materials here. Uh, the upper section of the dashboard is an injection molded material. It's soft touch, and then it's been after stitched right there with a contrasting stitch, whereas the lower portion seems to be various pieces of material that are integrated there. We also have a perforated section in that storage area. That's where you can drop your smartphone, other items like that right in that area. And then below that, we have a fairly small glove compartment. I was actually surprised how small that glove compartment was. You'd definitely not be able to fit a large tablet computer inside. On the center, we have another storage area right there. You can see I have a remote in there, and then there's a cable pass through if you want to pull the cable up. But the big thing going on in this interior is this absolutely enormous 12.3 inch LCD infotainment screen. Oddly enough, this LCD is about the same size that we find in modern Mercedes-Benz S-Class models, so it really is a big screen, but it's not standard. The standard screen is an 8-inch LCD. You'll only find this in the top two trims. An interesting twist with this software is that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto only operate in this small section of the display. The other side is used for something else in the vehicle. You can cycle between climate, seat climate, audio system information, trip readouts, settings screen there, etc. And you can flip flop it so you can have that on either side of the display and move the smartphone integration over to the other side. This allows you to have access to some of the car's menus, but it does mean that if you're taking a look at, for instance, a Google satellite map, it's not gonna be quite as snazzy as some of the alternatives that will use that full screen. Other than that, the rest of the software is very similar to what we've seen in other Toyota models before. So if we go back to the home menu there, this should be very familiar if you've driven any recent Toyota products. I have to admit that this software is not quite as intuitive as the widescreen format display that we see in the Telluride and the Palisade, but this display is bigger, 12.3 inches rather than 10 and a quarter like we see in the Hyundai and the Kia vehicles, but that software does appear to be a little bit easier to use. 
Below the screen, we have some physical buttons for the climate control system, heated and ventilated seats right there. And if you want to activate the rear climate control, we simply click on the climate option there, hit the rear button, and then you can see we have the rear climate control zone right within that window. And then of course, this system integrates the Wi-Fi access point as well as some of the vehicle telematics functions. Continuing our way down the dashboard, we have again that storage area right there, the vehicle power button, USB interface for the system, just one there. The other two are USB charge only ports, 12 volt power port right there. A pretty traditional shifter, even though this is a hybrid model. So drive is down there, sport mode over to the left side. We then have imitation manual shifts by toggling that shifter around. Two large cup holders there. Since we're not driving the all wheel drive model, the controls are a little bit different here. There's a drive mode button here, sport, norm, eco, traction control button, EV mode button, electric parking brake, and auto brake hold. The design of the center console hasn't really changed versus the last generation Highlander, so this is still a roller cover design rather than a hinged lid. Soft touch materials happen on either side and this center section right there that rolls. But one odd thing I found is that if you get the Qi wireless charging mat, that is hinged for some reason, and that makes this whole design just a little bit less convenient. The storage area is incredibly deep. You can see I can really stick my arm quite far down there. You could probably fit a two liter bottle of soda in there, probably half gallons of milk as well. But this Qi wireless charging mat just seems like it's in kind of an awkward space right there. On the driver's side, we have essentially the same instrument cluster tweaked for hybrid duty. So instead of a tachometer, we get the eco power and charge gauge right over here on the left, speedometer on the right, and then a large color multifunction display right in the middle. The multifunction display does change based on the trim that you get. This is the bigger version that you'll find in the upper end trims, but the overall functionality is not too, too different. We get the status of the vehicle's active safety systems, trip computer readouts, the ability to change certain vehicle settings, etc. The steering wheel is a three spoke design, essentially the same as the non hybrid model. This is a solid bottom spoke right down there at the bottom. We have sport grips at the top and it's leather wrapped. The overall design of the steering wheel reminds me a little bit of some modern Lexus models when it comes to the button modules on each side. They've divorced the infotainment button, so we have volume up and down on the left, track forward, backward over here on the right. You'll find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control, which is standard on all models over here on the right side. That's the button for the lane keeping assistance system. And then we have a phone button over here on the left and a back button for that multifunction LCD. Like many of you, I was a little bit skeptical about Toyota moving to a four cylinder hybrid system from their V6 hybrid system and how that would affect overall performance in the Highlander hybrid. Fortunately, the Highlander hybrid has lost weight over the last generation model, so that does help improve overall zero to 60 performance. That said, however, the hybrid model is still going to be slower than the gasoline only V6 model. Now, I don't think that Toyota really could have put too much more power under this hood because if you floor it, there is a really good amount of torque down there and you do get a little bit of torque steer in the front wheel drive versions. Now that's mitigated to a very slight extent if you choose the all wheel drive model, primarily because it's sending some of that power to the rear electric motors. But remember, there's no mechanical connection between the front and the rear. And that is going to be a big difference between this and something like the Ford Explorer hybrid. The Explorer hybrid does use a true mechanical all wheel drive system. And that's one of the reasons that its fuel economy is about 10 miles per gallon lower than a comparable all wheel drive Highlander. If you want an all wheel drive hybrid crossover with the most robust winter weather traction, that probably would be the Ford Explorer. Even though it's rear wheel drive based, that mechanical all wheel drive system will send more power to the other axle and split that power much more evenly than this hybrid system is capable of. However, as we've seen in other Toyota hybrid systems, we now have new electronic control systems to help distribute the power more equitably, and that should help improve overall winter weather traction versus the last generation model. They also tell us that the electric motor in this generation in the back is capable of delivering more power than the previous generation Highlander Hybrid, which will again help even out that power distribution versus the previous model. The other thing that some folks were asking about was, does this engine sound overstressed? And I have to say that so far, it actually sounds a little bit quieter and more refined than the V6 that it replaced. And that did surprise me a little bit. One of the areas that I really noticed a difference is in the amount of time that it takes to start the engine and the amount of vibration we get in the cabin when the engine is starting. It's definitely lower in this than it was in the outgoing Highlander Hybrid. Now that is logical when you think about it because this engine is smaller in terms of displacement. It also is a four cylinder engine rather than a six cylinder engine. So it's gonna take a lot less to get the engine going. Other than that, the Highlander Hybrid drives very much like the regular gasoline only version. The interior is definitely a little bit quieter than some of the entries in this segment. We don't have official zero to 60, 60 to zero or cabin noise scores just yet. You will have to wait until I can get this at home to test. But overall, the cabin definitely appears to be pretty quiet. We're driving out on a pretty rough road surface and it's definitely pretty easy to carry on cabin conversations. 
like the gasoline version of the Highlander, the overall ride quality is definitely tuned towards the softer side of things. So if you're looking for a really firm vehicle in this category, something with a really sporty driving dynamic, that's not going to be the Highlander or the Highlander Hybrid. You might want to look at something like the Mazda CX-9 or the Ford Explorer. They're both tuned slightly on the firmer side of this segment. The Highlander is definitely going to be more comfortable for long highway journeys, for your daily commute, taking the kids on the school run, etc. This is going to be a very comfortable vehicle to live with. It also is going to give you an incredible range. Thanks to the 36 mile per gallon range in the front wheel drive trim that we're driving here and the size of the gas tank, you can get 600 miles of real world range in this model, we're told. That's enough to take you well out of Texas, even though we're practically in the middle of it right now. Fuel economy is a little bit difficult to talk about because we haven't been driving this on our own home turf. We've also spent a lot of time idling, moving this around parking lots, zero to 60, accelerating and experiencing that torque steer, etc. We've been averaging just about 33 miles per gallon so far, but in a quick stint of steady state highway driving at 65 miles an hour, we were getting 37 miles per gallon. So I think the 36 mile per gallon overall score for this front wheel drive trim is definitely very, very reasonable. The extra weight and the extra wind resistance of this model is the reason that fuel economy is not 40 miles per gallon like we see in the RAV4. And then of course, there are also the changes that we see in this hybrid system. It is not exactly the same hybrid, even though it's the same engine. We get different electric motors, different basic transmission on the other side of the engine. Now, if we come to a complete stop here and then we floor it, you'll definitely notice just a little bit of one wheel slip right there, a little bit of gaining traction as we go, and then some gentle tugging on the steering wheel left to right because of the fact that this is a front wheel drive model. Now, there's a decent amount of torque thanks to these electric motors. Again, these are similar electric motors to what we saw in the last generation Highlander Hybrid, not what we see in the RAV4. So I suspect this system is probably giving us over 250, possibly even 300 pound-feet of torque, and that happens at very low RPMs, just as we see in full EVs out there. It's one of the benefits to a hybrid system like this. The other thing that I really noticed out on the road is that Toyota has significantly improved the braking feel of their hybrid systems, even over what we see in the RAV4 that we have long term back at home. If we're doing moderate braking, say we're slowing down here and then all of a sudden they need to switch to harsher braking, the previous generations of Toyota's hybrid systems had a moment where it felt like nothing was going on. And we don't see that in this generation of the Highlander Hybrid. They've really improved that switch from regenerative braking to friction braking and then back again. So if we're coming up on a turn here, for instance, and we're braking moderately and then a deer hops out in front of us and we have to transition to more heavy braking, that transition feels much more natural. It still doesn't feel quite like a traditional Highlander, but it's an awful lot closer. If you were a little bit concerned that this generation Highlander Hybrid has a four-cylinder engine under the hood, I would say there's really no cause for concern. This engine doesn't feel overtaxed. Remember that in your average daily driving situations, the engine is not really producing much power, and that's the whole point of a hybrid system like this, is to keep that engine in a very efficient power band for your average driving situations, and then have the battery pack and the electric motors for when you want to go faster, when you need more power. Toyota also seems to have focused on engine refinement and improving the isolation right there between the engine compartment and the passenger compartment. So unless this is floored, you really don't get much engine noise in the cabin. And I think what engine noise you do get is oddly enough, a little bit more refined than the last generation Highlander hybrid. So as you're climbing hills, you don't have to worry about this sounding like it's going to explode. Fortunately, Toyota was able to give us access to an all wheel drive Highlander Hybrid, and I was really surprised by the difference that the electric motor in the rear can make. It's a lot of this is down to software programming and the way that Toyota's been able to send power to the rear. Remember, the engine is still up front, but because we have that battery pack, it can send power to the rear while the engine is powering the front wheels, and it can also use the motor generator units up front to suck power from the engine and then move it along to the rear. So in this model, we definitely have less torque steer, whether we're talking about flooring the vehicle initially from a stop or in passing maneuvers as well. Now there is still torque steer, of course, because the majority of the power and torque is still going to the front axle. That's the same for this, the rest of Toyota's hybrid lineup, and of course, something like the Volvo XC60 T8 or XC90 T8 with their plug-in hybrid systems, because we have an even greater amount of power on their front axles than we have in this one. You'll really notice the difference if we complete a maneuver like we're about to do right here. So I'm gonna make a pretty sharp right-hand turn, and we're just gonna floor it right from a stop. We'll see how this goes. In the regular front-wheel drive version of the Highlander Hybrid, there was definitely a lot of scrabbling going on, a lot of torques there. 
this cuts a much sharper line. Now we still got a little for the front wheel peel there going on because again the majority of the power is happening up front but it was able to send a decent amount of power to the rear to help compensate for that. So the e-all wheel drive system in this vehicle is not just being used as a slip and grip style system. Toyota is also using it as a predictive all wheel drive system to help improve overall handling and overall dynamics of the vehicle. Bottom line out on the road if you're debating between the hybrid and the non-hybrid model give the hybrid a good long look. I don't think this is the same no-brainer situation that we have in the RAV4 where the hybrid seems like the only drivetrain that I would recommend in that model. It's a little bit faster than the non-hybrid model. It also is a little bit more powerful and it's significantly more fuel efficient. Over here in the hybrid Highlander, it's a little bit of a different value proposition. The big deal here is the fuel economy. We're going to have significant fuel savings in this model. You're going to pay that off probably for the average driver in about three years or so but this is definitely going to be slower than the V6 Highlander. It's not the better performing model in addition to being the more efficient model. It also is going to be more expensive, so definitely keep all of that in mind. If you want to get your hands on a Highlander Hybrid, contact your dealer now because this should be available on dealer lots by the end of December 2019. It'll set you back a little bit more than the last generation Highlander, however. This starts at $38,200. That surprised me because this now starts as a front-wheel drive hybrid, not an all-wheel drive hybrid like the last generation. This is about $1,600 more expensive than a comparably equipped V6 gasoline model. That price jump also surprised me a little bit because the RAV4 Hybrid is actually a really reasonable bump over the non-hybrid RAV4. And as with the rest of the Highlander lineup for 2020, if you get carried away with options, you'll end up over $50,000. This particular model, which again is a front wheel drive model, disregard that all wheel drive logo right there, came in just barely under $15,000. So you have to add $1,600 for all wheel drive. That means that this is notably more expensive than something like the Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid, which again, I think is a very, very direct competitor. Now, admittedly, the Pacifica Hybrid is not available with all wheel drive. It's not a crossover. It is a minivan, so it projects a very different image than this Highlander right here, but it's going to be notably less expensive and it's still gonna give you three rows. It's also gonna give you about 30 miles of electric only range. Now, once that battery is depleted, the Pacifica Hybrid is going to give you six miles per gallon less than this Highlander Hybrid right here because of the new updated hybrid system. But the Pacifica Hybrid could be significantly less. It's $40,245 starting, but it qualifies for a $7,500 federal tax credit, and that will drop its price significantly below this model that we're looking at here. But what about other crossover options? Well, an Acura MDX Hybrid is $52,900, so definitely more expensive than this top-end model right here and it's not going to be as well equipped. So versus an MDX Hybrid, the Highlander Hybrid is unquestionably an excellent value. It also is significantly more efficient, 27 miles per gallon in that one versus 36 in this front wheel drive model. Now the MDX Sport Hybrid is definitely more fun to drive, but interestingly enough, it's not quite as much fun to drive as the regular MDX, so that really narrows the delta down between Hybrid RAV4 and Hybrid MDX. The Ford Explorer Hybrid really is the odd twist in this segment because its hybrid system is nothing like this hybrid system, which is incidentally very, very similar to the hybrid system that we find in the Ford Escape. It instead uses a 3.3 liter V6 and a traditional 10-speed automatic transmission. That's how it maintains a 5,000 pound tow rating, basically the same as the rest of the Explorer lineup, and notably above this Highlander right here. If you are looking for a hybrid crossover and you want it to tow, the Hybrid Explorer really is your best option. The Hybrid Explorer is also going to give you slightly better overall performance, 318 horsepower out of that model, 322 pound-feet of torque versus what we find under this hood. The downside is that it's going to give you up to 10 miles per gallon less economy than this Highlander Hybrid. 25 if you choose all-wheel drive, 28 if you choose the rear-wheel drive Explorer. It's also worth noting that the last time I drove the Explorer Hybrid, it wasn't nearly as smooth as this Toyota Hybrid here, or really as smooth as the rest of the Ford Hybrid lineup. And that's due to the overall design of that hybrid system. Hopefully Ford has updated that software and softened things out a bit. We were driving a very, very early pre-production Hybrid Explorer, but the way that transmission and that hybrid system is designed, it's probably never going to be quite as smooth as the hybrid system that we find under this hood, or again, under the hood of other Ford hybrids. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and let me know what you would choose if you were shopping in this segment, especially considering the fact that the hybrid model has become more expensive than it was last year. 
Would you spend $40,000 on this hybrid with all wheel drive to get an LE version or would you get something else in the segment? Would you be willing to look at a minivan? If you're looking at the top end versions of this, would you be interested in looking at a luxury three row crossover that's available as a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid? There are a number of plug-in hybrid luxury crossovers out there. Let me know down there in the comment section below. And of course, stay tuned because we will have this at home to do a full and complete review on just as soon as we possibly can. In the meantime, be sure to click that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen if you haven't already done so. Head over to facebook.com slash alexnato so you can see what we're driving this week and I'll see you all later. Okay.